church. How is everyone this morning? Excellent. Pastor Jay is excellent. Anyone else? Yay. How many still have a lot of Christmas shopping to do? Few of you? Okay. I finished mine this week, so I'm excited about that. So I want to welcome everyone who's here with us in the room and those of us who are joining online. I'm so glad that you are here. How many have the YouVersion Bible app? How many use that? I use it all the time. So last week, they posted the verse that was shared, bookmarked, highlighted the most this year from all around the world. Not just the United States, all around the world. This is it. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Do not be afraid. He is with you. Why does he tell us that? It's because he loves us. Fear is torment. The Bible tells us that. God knows that it is. When my dog is afraid, I comfort her. Why? I love her. How much more does our Heavenly Father want to comfort you. And listen, when he says, do not fear, he means it. He knows who he is, and he knows we have nothing to be afraid of. Because he is with us, he will help us. He is your God. He loves his children. Don't be afraid. I know, I understand. But stand on his word. Do not be afraid. He is with you. And there's no one that loves you more than your Heavenly Father. Let's pray this morning and just give this service over to him. God, we thank you. God, I thank you that you are, God, are a God that does not want your children to fear. Thank you, God, for your love. Thank you, God, that you love us that our minds can't even comprehend how much you love us. We can't fully understand it because your love is so great. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. God, this service is yours, God. Have your way. Your way is the best way, God. Speak through our pastor. Holy Spirit, speak through our pastor this morning. God, I pray that we would have ears to hear what your spirit is saying. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Thank you, God. You have no rival. You have no equal. Thank you, God. Thank you for who you are. Thank you that there is nothing that is too difficult for you. Nothing, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. In the name of Jesus, that name that is above every name, Jesus. Amen.
Sometimes those voices try to tell me I'm forgotten and I'm falling too far from his hands. But I know what kind of God he is and I'm trusting in his promises. Believing I'm singing, yes he can. Did he move every mountain? Did he part every sea? Yes he did. So yes he darkness did he deliver me yes he did so yes he can whoa yes he did so yes he can because i've seen too much now i can't deny he's come through every single time from the beginning till the Did he part every sea? Yes, he did. So, yes, he can. Did he defeat the darkness? Did he deliver me? Yes, he did. So, yes, he can. Did he move every mountain? Did he part every sea? Yes, he did. So, yes, he can. Did he defeat the darkness? Did he deliver me? Yes, he did. So yes, he can. Whoa, yes, he did. So yes, he can. Yes, he did. Yes, he can. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We trust you, God, this morning, and we say yes, you can. Yes, you can this morning. We believe you for that. Hallelujah.
darkness did he deliver me yes he did so yes he can did he move every mountain did he part every sea yes he did so yes he can did he defeat the darkness did he deliver me yes he forgiver of our souls. Lord God, there's nothing beyond you. Let us rest in you this morning. Hallelujah, Lord God.
before the door you're breathing new life into dry bones i hear the echo the sound of heaven's song your spirit's calling me i know it's time to go i can't stay to how you're moving I can't stay here complacent anymore I can't stay here my heart is full of longing I can't stay here I know what I'm made for you're breathing new life into dry I can't stay here anymore. I can't stay here. I'm awakened to your whisper. I can't stay here. You tell me there is more. I can't stay here. My heart beats like thunder. I can't stay here. I'm running for the door. You're breathing new life into dry bones. I hear the echo, the sound of heaven's song. Your spirit's calling me. I know it's time to go.
make that decision, church, to not stay here anymore. It's a conscious decision. I won't stay here. I won't stay here stagnant. I won't stay here ignoring. I won't stay here complacent. I've started to hear your whisper, but I'm not going to stay here. I'm going to walk, walk in your leading, in the leading of God. Will you make that decision today, guys? He's calling us to deeper. He's calling us to more because he loves us. He has so much good for us. Are you ready, church? Will you walk? I struggled with that this week as I was practicing this song. And I asked myself, am I willing to give up what I want? Am I willing to give up my desires? Am I willing to listen to the Bible instead of listen to something else or watch TV, watch that show I'm really into? Am I willing to go deeper and seek him more and give him more of my time? Are you willing? Because what I want might be cool and good, but what he has for us is so much better. It is so much better. So make that decision today, guys. He has so much for you, so much better for you. Father, I just thank you, God, that you are good, that you have better for us. And God, as we choose you, as we decide to spend more time with you, to follow what you ask of us, to obey you, God, even when it's scary, even when it's hard, even when I want to do something else. God, I thank you that you are faithful and you are good and you have so much good for us. And we make that decision today to walk forward with you, to choose you, to decide I won't stay here anymore. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing, God. Thank you, Jesus. song called from the, between the altar and the door and it talks about the conflict that we have between th saying things at church and then living them out as we go out the doors I'm hesitant sometimes to do things but I'm going to do them anyways I think this morning if this is really your prayer then there needs to be something done you can't sit there and say you're going to do something so I want you to do something that probably is a little uncomfortable if this really is your prayer this morning, that you are ready for something deeper, that you're ready for this furious flood, then I just want you to stand up and I want you to come to these altars. I'm not going to sing over you. I'm not going to make it comfortable because sometimes in life, things aren't comfortable. So I'm just going to keep playing. And if you, this is your desire, then come forward. happens and that's okay life happens things happen sound systems happen songs happen things happen and that's okay the point is shrinking back will lead you only to isolation it is when you step out anyway when life happens and it is when you step out and say i'm gonna chase god i am gonna chase you because i love you i don't care what's happening I don't care about shrinking back. 
Whatever life is throwing at me right now, you are better. You are more worth it. You are more valuable than that. So when life happens, shrinking back only leads to worse. Now is the time to come forward in your hurts. Even if you are hurt, now is the time to come forward. Even if you have pains, now is the time to come forward. Even if you have hangups, now is the time to come forward. Because God, you are so much more worth that. You are worth it every bit. You are more valuable than what life can throw at me. You are more valuable than what wrong can happen. You are more valuable than the mistakes that I make. You are more valuable, so God, we choose to come forward even in the middle of our pains, even in the middle of our hurts, of our hang-ups. We choose to come forward because we know there's worth in it. There's worth in coming forward and there's worth in meeting you here. to go deeper. We are ready for the new wine to be poured into the new wine skins. Oh Lord, there was a day when we were not ready, when we were not prepared. But that day is long past and we stand here around this altar today saying, Lord God, whatever we have to do to move forward, whatever sacrifice we have to make, whatever difficulty we have to endure, Whatever thing we have to do in order for us as a people to enter into the healing you're talking to us about, we are ready to go there, God. 
Some of us don't even know what that something is yet, but Lord, we are ready, we are ready to let you reveal it to us. We believe you have prepared us as a people, and we know that we are at the starting line, but we are ready to launch out into that deeper place. Not just because you've prepared us, but because we know that you are a God who will walk with us every step of the way. And so God, though the world would tell us to be afraid, though the world would tell us in the days ahead to flee like a bird to the mountains, we will not do that, for we look to the hills from whence comes our help. Our help comes from the Lord, and we know that we know that we know that we know it. And we are here to declare, God, that we are open to your help. We are not going to operate in pride any longer, trying to do it on our own. But we are here at this altar saying we're ready. We're ready for deeper. We're ready for furious flood. We're ready for glory. We're ready for kingdom come. Not because it's in us, but because we know it's in you and you are in us. We've settled that, Lord. And so we declare that it is so, it is so, it is so. As your people stand around this altar today, God, we stand not saying the work is finished, but saying the work has just begun. We acknowledge that. We're not saying we're walking away from these altars all fixed and everything's good, but we're saying we're making a statement here today by gathering at these altars saying we're ready to move on. The time of being stuck in the wilderness is over. The time to step into the promised land as Joshua's army has come. And so God, we take this time as our marking point and our step in Jesus, Jesus mighty name. We're gonna sing this song once more from the, from the bridge. I'm ready. And I want you to sing it in faith. And even if your heart is a little nervous, even if your heart is a little, a little uh, trepidatious about what this might mean for you, I want you to just by faith declare that you're ready for deeper. Let's take it nice and slow. We don't have to rush this. We're just gonna confess it over ourselves and our church today and say, we're ready, we're ready, we're ready. I'm ready for furious flood. I'm ready for glory. I'm ready for kingdom come. I'm ready for deeper. I'm ready for furious flood. I'm ready for glory. I'm ready for kingdom come, I'm ready for deeper, I'm ready for furious flood, I'm ready for glory, I'm ready for kingdom Sing it one more time. I'm ready for deeper, I'm ready for furious flood. 
Now, all those of you who are ready to move on, are you ready? Are you ready? Amen. Amen and amen. Worship team, I'm going to have you sit down for the moment, and I'm going to have you come back at the end to finish that last song. God is so good. I knew that at the end of this song, I can't stay here anymore. We were going to take a little break. As we were singing it, I was like, the time has come to take a break. And I said, no, maybe I'll let them finish their sentence. You can if you want. Sure, or you can step down. It's up to you. What do you need? If you need a, need a break, go right ahead. No pressure. No pressure. So I knew that this, this was going to happen. And then I said, well, maybe we'll let them finish their last song because their last song is really good. But I think it's where we're going to finish as we're going to use it to put an exclamation point on this service today. And as Melanie was saying her bit and Patrick was saying his bit and Jody was saying his bit, I thought, I better get up there before they preach my whole sermon. <laughs> I'm so thankful. You're welcome. So thankful for the confirmation of the Holy Spirit. We're going to launch right in to our third message of Christmas. Awesome. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Before we do that, we're going to do offering and a few announcements. So I'm going to call for the offering to come forward at this point. At this time, it's a good, it's a good moment for, us, for me to say we do not have children's church today because our bathrooms downstairs have gone kaput. Um, so we have somebody coming in this week, and so we're believing God uh, for a fix, right? I said to one of the deacon board members on Monday night, I said, we're trying to get these things fixed because the bathroom, uh, the uh, pump has failed in our, in our cellar. And uh, our, one of our deacons said, well, of course it has. <laughs> because how many of you know the enemy does not want us to move on yeah. into what God's coming? Yeah. So uh, God is doing but we're here today to say that our God shall supply all our need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. I'm so thankful for those of you who have made the step towards greater giving. And I'm so thankful that I know, I know that my God who split the Red Sea, my God who uh, took a coin out of the fish's mouth so he could pay the the temple tax, my God is more than able to meet every need that his body has. Father, this morning, we thank you for this offering, Lord. We thank you for what the people have given. We thank you for the giver and the gift. And we thank you that you are our provider. You are Jehovah Jireh. You shall supply every need we have as a congregation and as individuals in the congregation. We bless your name in confidence of that fact. And so as we bring these gifts to you as an offering, we know that we can never outgive our God, but he shall pour back all into our personal lives and into our corporate lives. So God, for this issue with our, our pump in the cellar, we pray that you would bless it and cause it to just be an easy fix, Lord God. We pray that you provide every bit of funding for it. We pray for the other projects that we have around the church here that you would provide for every one of them. We pray for the ministry that you have going forward. It is totally by faith in you, Lord God. You must supply. And so we cry out to you, recognizing that you shall. We just said it. We aren't going to do this in our own power anymore. We aren't going to operate in a place of pride, pretending we can do the work that you've given us to do in our own strength, but we are moving forward because you can. And we trust you in this. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Everyone give the Lord a hand for what he's doing. <clears throat> we have a few other announcements quickly. We have a Christmas Day service next week, and it's going to be a launch off of this one. Um, it is, it is uh, going to be exactly an hour, maybe a little less, if everybody talks real fast and sings real good. 
uh, but we are going to have that. We are also announcing that there is no next generation ministry next week on Tuesday. So December 27th or January 3rd, please make note of that if you have a child in Royal Rangers, girls ministry or youth ministry. And we are coming very quickly into our 21 days of fasting and prayer. Amen. Amen. I'm very excited about this time. Thank you, Zach, for that. Because everyone else was kind of grim. We have decided, so you can fast any way you want during this 21 days of fasting and prayer. It starts on January 8th, goes until January 29th. We ask the whole congregation to join in in whatever way you can. I'm not going to tell you how to fast. If you have something that the Lord has told you, this is your fast, then you obey God. If you do not yet have that, I'm going to encourage the congregation to join us in the Daniel fast. On January 1st, we will have a full pamphlet out describing how to do the Daniel fast along with 21 days of devotion, scriptural uh, meditations that we'll be focusing on. This year, God has told us very, very clearly that we are going to be focusing on breakthrough in our prayer time. Victory, breakthrough, and healing of our hurts, habits, and hang-ups. So I believe that God is about to move us forward. That song that we sang this morning, I Can't Stay Here Anymore, that song is going to be launched into action during our 21 days of fasting and prayer. Where we are now is not where we're going to be at the end of 2023. Amen? Amen. Amen. So join us for that time. It's going to be very exciting. At the end of our 21 days of fasting and prayer, we will be taking a miracle offering. I told you all last week where we ended up for the year. By faith, we are going to begin to turn that ship around and see God bring in his superabundance. Sam gave me a word about abundance last week at the end of service, and I believe that that's a word for us as a corporate body and for us as individuals. If you're struggling and you need abundance, I believe God's going to pour it in. How many of you will receive that word today by faith? Okay. Uh, deacon nominations start today, believe it or not. We are almost to our, it's almost annual business meeting time, folks. Um, we are uh, launching into our deacon nominations today. There are deacon nominations out on each of the tables. There's only one place that you can get your deacon nominations. I don't know why I do these announcements. Because I don't know nothing. So the deacon nominations are out in the foyer if you would like them. You can nominate a deacon if you are a member of the church. Okay, so if you are a voting member of the church, you can nominate someone for the position of deacon. If you are not a voting member of the church, what can you not do? Nominate a deacon. <laughs> so if you are a member of the church, not, feel free to nominate um, there are qualifications there for deacon. We are looking for three deacons, and uh, we are also uh, going to be casting, and we do lots here. We don't, we don't vote for anybody. We let God pick our deacons and our board. So we nominate them. They get nominated. Then we put everybody's name in a hat, and we draw, we draw lots for who it is that's going to serve for the following year. So uh, we'll be vetting what the process is for the next two, two weeks. We'll be nominating deacons. Then on the 8th, the deacon board will get together with myself, and we will vet the nominations to make sure that they, everybody who's been nominated qualifies. Then those people if, will be qu contacted to see if they want to let their name stand. If their names stand, they let their name stand. Then we will put their name in the hat at the annual business meeting, and we will draw their names. We are looking for three deacons, treasurer, and church board secretary. That's, that's our, those are the positions that are open, coming open this year. All right? Excellent. That was a very long announcement. Are there any others? No, good. I'm your lead pastor, Jay Lilly. <laughs> and as I said, uh, we have... Um, the, the Spirit of the Lord is really speaking here this morning. How many of you have sensed that from the, opening, from the opening beat? We were just here as a congregation, and our hearts were testifying to what we heard uh, regarding the worship music. I, was, I, I just felt uh, the, that we were in the presence of the Lord from that very first song, Yes, We Can. Yes, He Can. 
And it's a powerful, what, was, what the worship team did, I love it when the worship team prepares the ground and they did an excellent job of preparing the ground for us today. We're in our third sermon of Christmas and we're talking about the Christmas story from four different angles as stories. We are, we've talked about the Christmas story as an epic. Do you know what an epic is? It's a large uh, it's the big story that involves, in, in other religions, the epic is where the gods get involved and push into the realm of mankind. And the story of Christmas is really the story of God pushing through the fabric of reality to get involved in the lives of men. We talked in our first week about how the story of Christmas from John chapter 1 was the story of God breaking from eternity into time. Last week, we talked about how uh, the story of Christmas is a history. And all this week, we've been talking about how God has taken a very long time to prepare the work so that you and I could come to faith. Now, this week's story is perhaps the simplest. In fact, as I was preparing to preach it, I was like, wow, this is way too simple, God. And I really only have one point today. We're talking today from the book of Luke about how the Christmas story is a reality series. It's nonfiction. The Bible is real. The Bible is true. Everything it says is true. Now, we say we believe that. I believe it. We sang, used to sing songs about it when I was a kid, you know. Um, the, if it's written in the Bible, I'll believe it till I die. C.S. Lewis said that most of us as Christians live as practical atheists. We say we believe. But when it comes right down to it, do we really? That's the challenge. Do I believe every word that's written in the book? Well, let's check it out. So we're talking about Jesus today as a reality series, a nonfiction documentary. And next week, we'll be launching off of this into a hero's journey. The story of Christmas is a hero's journey. Jesus came to help us so that we could once again become the heroes of our own story. That's the point of Christmas. And we'll be talking about that next week. This is all part of a much larger study we're going to do as the church to see how Jesus did life together with people when he came to earth the first time. So over the course of the next several months, we're going to be discussing how Jesus did life with people as a human being. Jesus interacted as a human being, and he was very human in his interactions with men and women. How he did life together as a priest, as the high priest of Israel and, in fact, the entire Gentile world. As a prophet, as a servant, as a teacher, as an encourager, as a giver, as a leader, as a worker of miracles, as a healer, as an apostle, as a pastor, as an evangelist, and finally, as Messiah. And somewhere in all of the next couple of months of preaching, except for the idea of Messiah, you are going to find yourself saying, ah, oh, that's who I am. And this is how Jesus did life with people like I do life with people. And in learning to do that, you'll discover your gift. And then you'll really begin to change the world around you. So let's start today with the book of Luke chapter 1. And we're going to read the whole chapter today. We're going to take little breaks in between. But we're going to march right through this. Are you ready? You're ready. Thank you, Jerry. Is anybody else ready? Yeah. Amen. So Luke chapter 1, Lord, bless the words of my mouth. Let the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Open this congregation's ears, their minds, their hearts, their souls, their spirits to receive exactly what you have for them. Lord, if there be any wicked way inside of us, begin now by the power of your Holy Spirit and by the strength of your redemptive nature to change us and transform us as you see fit in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter 1 says this, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. 
just as they were handed down to us by those who from the, the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. The first thing we need to know about this Christmas story in the book of Luke is that Luke sat down to write to us a carefully investigated, orderly, certain eyewitness account of Christmas. What Luke is saying in this first few verses is this is a true story. It comes from the mouth of eyewitnesses who have verified that what we say is really what happened. Everything that you're about to read, Luke says, is true story. There's none of it that's made up. There's none of it that's fancied up. This is how it happened right from the horse's mouth. Now, I would put to you that that's what the whole Bible is. Amen? The Bible is a true story. There is none of it that's made up. Oh, Pastor Jay, surely you don't believe that. You're an educated sort of guy. Surely you don't believe everything that's written in the Bible. That's crazy talk. Even some of the things Jesus said are just nuts. And you're all saying, what? Things that Jesus said were just nuts? Sure. On the surface, let's see how many of us practice these things. If someone slaps you in the face, let them slap you again. Jesus surely didn't mean that, Pastor Jay. He was just kidding. If someone slaps you, you're supposed to slap them back. Okay. Well, then that means the Bible isn't true. Either Jesus said it as a command, or it's a lie. You tell me. What do you believe? Bless your enemies. Pray for them who despitefully use you. I tell you that any of you who allows hate in his heart is in danger of going to hell. Oh, I just hate that person. Any of you who says you're an idiot is in danger of the hellfire. Oh, surely that was an exaggeration. Jesus was just exaggerating. Do we still believe the Bible when it disagrees with our lifestyle? Or do we believe what it says? Luke says that the Bible particularly this story, is a carefully investigated, orderly, certain eyewitness account. And I would put to you that the whole Bible, from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-whatever, is true story, no matter how crazy it sounds. How many of you are with me on that? Verse 5, in the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a certain priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abiah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you and many will rejoice because of his birth for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. 
He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant, and for five months, she remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. The Bible is a true story, even when it gets crazy, wacky fantasy. This is a carefully investigated, orderly, certain eyewitness account of the spirit realm as well as the natural realm. Now, in in much of the world, this story was not a problem to believe for people for many generations. But in our Western world, which only really values what we can see, hear, taste, smell, and touch, we have to admit that we have a problem with this. Oh, in our heads, maybe we can wrap ourselves around the idea that there's a spirit realm. But for most of us, as soon as it starts getting all spirity, we're out the back door. Oh, God, I just, I love your spirit. And what we mean by that is I love it when we sing a song that begins to stir my heart. But if angels start showing up in church and knocking people over, we're out the back door. But I'm here to tell you that I really do believe in angels. I believe in the spirit realm. I believe in the angelic realm, and I believe in the demonic realm. And I have experienced both of them. And you can say, oh, Pastor Jay, we live in a real world. There's no such thing as angelic visitation or demonic possession. But the truth is the truth, and the Bible tells us the truth. And we have to stop living in our Western reality where we insist that the whole world is explainable by the logic of what we can see, hear, taste, touch, and smell. There's a whole realm which you can't use your five natural senses to discern. The only way you can touch that realm is by having your spirit brought to life and experiencing it with your spirit connection. That's the only way. And the Bible tells us that this is a carefully investigated, orderly, certain eyewitness account of the spirit realm. We cannot believe the Bible without believing in the spirit realm and without believing in the supernatural. There is no way. You cannot be a totally natural person and think that there is only this world here and believe the Bible because there's a whole other side. In the sixth month, verse 26 says, of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you 
and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. Somebody say amen. amen. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your words to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And in a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord will fulfill his promises to her. This story, and in fact the whole Bible, is a carefully investigated, orderly, certain eyewitness account of the Holy Spirit doing miracles among men. I'm going to say that again. This story and the entire Bible is a carefully investigated, orderly, certain eyewitness account of the Holy Spirit doing miracles among men, among us. You see, it's not just enough to believe that the Bible is true, and it's not just enough to believe that there's a natural realm and a spirit realm. Because, you know, I guess in, in the long run, it's easy to believe that, you know, okay, when you die, you go to a better place. Just about everyone believes that. Every funeral I've gone to, even those who lived the, the worst sort of life and didn't have any kind of faith, everybody says, oh, they've gone to a better place. Now, whether that's true or not, most people don't have too much difficulty believing there's something beyond this. Some people don't, but most, when pressed, do. But when you get down to the idea that the supernatural realm is not something that just manifests after you die, but it's something that is breaking in here, right here, right now. When you don't just believe that, well, up until 2,000 years ago, the Holy Spirit used to be active, and every story in the Bible is true, but it stopped at, with the divine revelation of John the Revelator. And so in Revelation chapter 22, that was the last moment that God actually ever visited anybody. And the Holy Spirit hasn't done a lick of work since then of supernatural the only thing that we actually believe God does now is through the Bible, and so God uses the Bible, and the Bible teaches everybody, and so we don't have any more need for the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit among us. Oh, Pastor Jay, we're Pentecostal. We believe in the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. As long as you're the one doing it, we're good with it. Because, you know, I don't want any of that weirdness flowing out of my body. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad that you can speak in tongues, Pastor Jay. It's good to be serving in a Pentecostal church where the work of the Holy Spirit is active among us. But don't you require me to speak in tongues. I don't want to be speaking in no funny language. I, 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 I don't want none of that. Healing, that's the work for the pastor. I don't want to have to pray for people and actually lay my hands on them and have to expect something to happen to them. Raise the dead? I don't even know how to heal a cold. But if we're really going to believe the word of God, you see, here's the thing. Mary wasn't a pastor. Elizabeth wasn't an, a, a traveling evangelist. None of these people. Joseph wasn't a prophet. None of these people had creds. None of them had the REV in front of their name. 
They were, he was a carpenter. She was a teenager. Elizabeth was an old woman walking around with her walking stick. The Holy Spirit broke into normal people's lives. He didn't wait for them to finish Bible college. Mary probably didn't even know how to read. He didn't wait for them to get recognized by a denominational affiliation. He just showed up. Oh, but everything must be done in order. Yeah, tell that to Mary. Her whole thing with Jesus was a little out of order. She was a virgin having a baby. If there's anything more out of order, I don't know what it was. Now, listen, I understand everything must be done decently and in order, and it's, you know, okay, so, but what's order? the Holy Spirit shows up. And when he shows up, you better just let him show up. Mary's response was correct. Okay, God, if that's what you want, have at it. She surrendered to the move of God. If we truly believe the Bible, we've got to do the same thing. I received a prophecy a couple weeks ago from someone in the body I didn't particularly care for. But it was a right word. It was a good word. It was a powerful word. I don't know exactly what it's going to require of me. But it was a word from the Lord. Be it unto me according to your will. That's our response to the move of the Holy Spirit. And if we believe in the word, we believe in the Bible, well, then we better get ready I can't stay here. You know why we stay in one place for so long as Christians? Because we're saying to God, oh, I'm good here. I can stay here. It's only when we get to that place of divine dissatisfaction that we say, I can't stay here anymore, God. I need more of you. And I believe your word has more for me. And I'm willing to step out in it, even if it's hard, even if it crucifies my pride, even if it calls me to do things in a way that I don't necessarily like or want to do them. God, be it unto me according to your will. Verse 46. And Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant." From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. Wow, that's a line. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. I'm going to call the worship team forward at this time. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son, and her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, he is to be called John. They said to her, there is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately, his mouth was opened and his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe, and through the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, "When? what then is this child going to be? 
for the Lord's hand was with him. His father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. The oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hands of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. Jody, you can start playing. This story is a carefully investigated, orderly, certain eyewitness account of the need for men to respond in faith. And we just had an altar call up here. There are people in this room right now I guess I'm going to go back here. When I was a kid in school, I was in band. And our conductor's name was Phil Croto. And every time we would get together to rehearse for a concert or whatever, the very first thing he would do, the very first thing Phil, Mr. Croto, would do was he would get out his little uh, pitch pipe and he would blow on that pitch pipe and then he would go section by section through the band and say, this is a B flat, hit the B flat. And we would tune. This message is not complicated, but there are many of us in this room who need to hear it because God is calling us to back to the very beginning of the, of, of the band practice, of the orchestral assignment. And he's saying, before we can go on, we have to tune. We have to tune to the main note of faith. That's what God is doing right here. This is not a hard lesson. This is basic Christianity. I'm not preaching deep theology here. I have one point today. If we are going to go anywhere as a church, we have to believe the word of God. We have to believe what it actually says, and we have to believe it applies to us. Faith is concert B flat. And only when a whole church begins to tune to that one note of faith does it begin to move forward. We haven't begun playing the concert yet, folks. We've been sitting in rehearsal for all these years, just learning our parts. And whether you know it or not, you've learned your part. And you're saying, what are you, what are you saying, Pastor Jay? I don't know my part. Yes, you do. You've lived it. You've been practicing the entirety of your Christian life, just waiting for the concert to begin. You've been sitting at home practicing your part just by living your life. Now it's time for you to come and tune to the note of the church, to tune to faith and say, everything I've learned in life, I'm now going to apply to living out the word of God because I believe it. It's kind of an in or out thing. Either you believe it or you don't. Either, either the word of God is the word of God or it's a lie. You can't have it both ways because the word of God says of itself, this is the truth. And if you don't believe it, well, okay, that's a choice. But you can come to church your whole life and if you don't 
operate in the church in a place of belief and faith, that the whole word actually means exactly what it says, then you're not a believer because by definition, you're not a believer. And if that's so, then you're kind of like a band member who's sitting as the conductor is getting ready to say, tune to concert B flat, and you're saying, oh, I can't. I, I like to hold my instrument, I just don't like to play it. Well, what conductor is gonna let you stay on the stage if all you're gonna do through the whole concert is just sit there with your tuba in your lap and be like, hi, mom! Faith requires you to do something. Faith requires you to activate your belief in the word of God and say, oh, the word of God actually says what the, says the truth. This isn't hard stuff. This is beginner's stuff. We're at the tuning note, not at the concert. We haven't gotten into the hard stuff yet. But there are people in this room right now who I know are struggling to actually believe the word of God. Well, maybe this isn't so hard. This is the Christmas story, and everyone likes the story of the little baby Jesus in the manger. That's not so hard to believe. But when it comes down to the rest of it, the part that actually costs us something, that's the part where we struggle. But see, Jesus is saying, either believe this or don't. Either tune with the congregation or don't. Either tune with the congregation or get off the stage. Now that sounds harsh. I don't mean it to be harsh, but it's the beginning of reality for us. If we stood here this morning and say we can't stay here, then we have to realize that we, if, if, if we're gonna move beyond where we're at right now, then we have to accept the fact that we're gonna have to do something different than what we've always done. We're gonna have to step into levels of faith that we've never stepped into before. We're gonna have to begin to practice levels of Christianity that we've not practiced before. We're gonna have to allow deeper healing than we've ever believed for before. Because moving on, moving into the new wine, moving into the new wine skin, means change and you can't change and stay the same you can't change and do the same thing every one of us is required to step forward saying God I believe so this is a question of what are we going to do this morning are we going to move forward and why why would I, I, I I'm happy where I am Pastor Jay I have everything I need you know who said that in the Bible? You know who said, I, I, I have everything I need. I'm, I'm good where I am. I don't have to go any further. You know who said that? The church in Laodicea. I'm rich. I don't have need of anything else. I'm good, God. And God said, no. You, there is more for you. There is more for you. And it's time for you to step. Oh, but God, I'm so old. So was Elizabeth. Testified last week how Wendy said, I'm so glad God didn't wait till I was 83 for this move. Tom Murphy came up to her after service and said, I'm 82. God did wait that long for me. Doesn't matter. God waited till Elizabeth was beyond the age of childbearing to give her a kid. There's, God says there's more. And many of you got up here this morning and said, I'm ready for more. Your age doesn't matter. Your physical condition doesn't matter. What you know or don't know doesn't matter. There's more. No, but it's not just about you either. You see, he's worthy of it all. He's worthy of everything. And only when we begin to enter into that place where you say, God, there's no price too high. There's no, there's no commitment that I have to make that's gonna cost more than you're worthy of. 
There's no amount of humbling myself. There's no amount of giving of myself. There's no amount of stepping forward into you. There's no amount of prayer. There's no amount of study. There's no amount of ministry. There's no amount of anything that I'm going to give you that's going to begin to even match how worthy you are of all my dedication. So this morning, we're going to sing this song. I'm going to have the worship team come. And we're just going to sing worthy of it all. And if you are truly ready to do what you came forward to this altar, this is a second dedication. If you're truly ready to say, God, I can't stay here because you're worthy of it all. I want you just to stand. You can stand where you are. You can come back down around the altar. We have one more thing to do after this time of prayer and dedication. But if you are ready to make that dedication and just say, yeah, God, I can't stay here because you're too worthy. You're too worthy. And I do believe everything that your word says about me, about us, and about you. If you're ready to make that commitment, then just stand as we sing together. Go ahead. Church. Oh, worship the Lord with me. Worship the 
the Lord with me. Give him everything, everything. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. We believe. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. pray this prayer with me, a prayer of dedication of your heart. Father God, I say before you today, before all the assembled saints and angels, I believe your word. I believe all of it. And I dedicate myself to living it out. Holy Spirit, help me. I welcome your help and all of heaven's help. I give myself to you afresh. I belong to a mighty God. In Jesus' name, amen. Now give the Lord a, a hand of praise in the house. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You can be seated. Before you go, here's one of the things that we know about God. And ben, I'm, Pastor Man, I'm going to have you come forward with anybody from your team that you choose. The church is not just a one-generation flat thing. 
It's, a, it's, a, it's a, an organism. It's not even just an organization. We're not just a corporation. We're an organism that reaches across the generations from everyone from 120 all the way down to zero. Now today we couldn't have kids church, but our team put together some gifts for all of the kids in our kids church. So if you are anywhere from the age of zero to 12, if you'd come forward at this point, because as a congregation, we have a gift for you, but we're also gonna pray over every one of you today. Come on down. Okay, hold on, hold on. Stay right here, because we're gonna pray for you, okay? Is that good? Yeah, I know, because you're a little evangelist there. You have the power of the Holy Ghost coming on you, kid. Is there anybody else? Anybody else in the house? Would the congregation stand with me? Because we're going to pray a blessing on these kids and pray a multiplication of this generation within our house. Stretch forth your hand of faith. Father God, by faith, we release a blessing onto these kids, onto these children at this Christmas season. These are your children and the sheep of your pasture, and we love them as a congregation. We pray a blessing upon them. We pray your hand upon them. We pray the growth of faith and their, get, and, and their gifts in their life so that they may be all you created them to be. As a congregation, Lord, we bless them in Jesus' name. And we proclaim a multiplication of this generation in our church. Send to us every child you would have us disciple. We ask that you help us to be faithful and to do all we can to bless, bless this generation with faith, hope, and love. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. Merry Christmas, kids. And let me pray a blessing over each of you today. Father God, I thank you for this wonderful congregation, and I thank you for all that is happening in it. I thank you, Lord God, even in the midst of tests and trials, even in the midst of hardships, this people is walking in a faith level that is growing every day. I sense it in my heart of hearts, and I bless them in your name, Jesus. I bless them with every spiritual blessing. I thank you. I thank you for bringing us together, and I thank you for allowing me to stand and watch and see the power of faith growing in them. Jesus, your Holy Spirit, is doing wonderful things in, through, and for us. And we ask more, 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 because we know that is your desire in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Be at peace and bring your peace and blessing to your mission field. Amen? Talk to you later.